Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Last time I told you what I have seen on the streets of Manhattan, New York uh, on September 11. And also that I have returned to Washington DC where I used to live and that I found amazing stuff. That, that uh, n not only the Americans uh, uh, had their normal relationships with Muslims. No, it was even excellent. It was even better relationships than normal. And uh, that some of them offered us great support. And I told you that many non-Muslim women wore hijab and came to the mosques saying, we will accompany your women to the malls and supermarkets so that any extremist would know that if he assaults a Muslim woman, he could be assaulting one of us, one of the non-Muslim women. Then within a month, all those situations changed. People's attitudes changed. The very same people who had supported us harbored animosity towards us. The very same people who were on our side were now against us. The very same people who after 9-11 came to the mosque saying, we will protect you, where, I'm sorry to say, spitting on the ground upon seeing us. So what had happened? What had taken place? What had brought about such a change in people's attitudes towards us? Don't tell me it's because of September 11 events. I have already told you that after 9-11, those people were supportive to Muslims. The key word is the media. Whoever watched TV in the US for one hour in this first month after 9-11 used to watch a scene of an Afghan woman shot by the Taliban in a football pitch in front of an audience at least six times in a single hour. Before the show, he would watch that shot. After the show, he would watch that shot. During the show, he would watch that shot. In the break, he would watch that shot. It was displayed every 10 to 15 minutes. After that, he would go out to the supermarket to buy cigarettes, and he would also see the photo of the same Afghan woman being executed in the football field on the first page of newspapers. Once out of the supermarket, he would get on board a bus or a train, and he would find a passenger in front of him holding the newspaper with the same photo also he has just seen in the supermarket, on the supermarket shelf. With the same scene that he also saw on TV. During the show, before the show, so he was brainwashed and started to think that this religion is characterized by extremism and cruelty, by indulgence in killing. Subsequently, he starts to think that it's either us or them in this world. So for him, the war against Islam became a battle for existence. If I didn't kill them today, they will kill me tomorrow. In this way, people's minds were not only manipulated or brainwashed, this was brain poisoning. Because that ideology instills hatred amongst neighbors, hatred amongst students and colleagues. Actually, it is not an ideology, it's insanity. Insanity which spreads by force of words, by the power of the media. But where is the Muslims' media? If you go through a handbook of American doctors, that is a book listing names of doctors published by companies of health insurance or so and so, um, uh, at least a quarter or one third of American doctors are Muslims. And who have more influence in shaping trends in the community, doctors or journalists? 
A doctor would see 10 to 20 patients per day and just tells the patient to open his mouth, stick out his tongue and say, ah, while the journalist writes an article read by millions every day, millions of readers, that enables him to change thought trends in the society with all respect to doctors. But who is more influential? Doctors and engineers or media personnel and journalists? There's a surah in the Quran that I believe that had it been revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the 20th or the 21st century, maybe it would have been named Surat the Journalists or the Media Personnel. And that is Surat Ash-Shu'ara, the Poets, which tells us about how dangerous poetry and poets were at that time. They were the media of that era to whom people listened. They could change thought trends in the society. They could start wars if they wanted to. They could spread peace if they wanted to. And as for the poets, the deluded ones follow them, as the Quran says. The Quran says, And as for the poets, the deluded ones follow them. Most people don't verify the truth of what they hear and always tend to believe negative speech and accusations, even if it's just nonsense or as we call it in Egypt, uh, talk. Simple minded people believe everything. The question is, how did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, face the media people of his era? How did he face uh, uh, poets? He faced them with Islamic media. He had his own poets, the poets of the Prophet, which was more professional. Whoever studies the poetry of the Prophet's poets, such as Hassan ibn Thabit, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, Ka'b ibn Malik, he would find it technically better than that of the hostile tribes' poets. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to tell Hassan ibn Thabit, attack them with your poetry and the Holy Spirit will help you. And also in another hadith, attack them with your poetry as it is tougher on them than arrows. So what we need today uh, to change the status of weakness in which we are uh, uh, in is a professional media. Instead of telling your son to become a doctor or an engineer, I want, to st I want to see a father telling his son, I want you to be a journalist to defend Islam, or tell his daughter to become a journalist to defend Islam. When Pharaoh told the surrounding elite, let me kill Moses, was he asking permission? No. Daruni aqatul Musa, allow me to kill Moses. Pharaoh did not need permission from anyone. He was bidding them to prepare the public opinion to accept the carnages he was about to commit. Indeed, these are just a small gang, which means that Musa, that's what the Quran tells us, that he said, these are just a small gang, uh, which means that Musa or Moses and who believed with him are mis a misled faction. Indeed, I am afraid that he may exchange your religion or that he may cause corruption to appear in the land. He told them, Inni akhafu ay deenakum aw ay fil ardi al fasad. I'm afraid that he will exchange your religion. He will make you commit kufr and leave your religion, the religion of the ancient Egyptians. And or may corruption appear in the land. The land here is Egypt, which means that I'm afraid that terrorism would take place. Probable terrorism may take place. Through history, media played the same role in deluding people, dehumanizing the opposition, calling them sheep or cockroaches. If you dehumanize them, it is acceptable to kill or crush them because cockroaches are crushed to clean the environment. And it is acceptable to slaughter them because sheep are slaughtered, because it's even acceptable to burn them 
because sheep are grilled. Because this is normal. That is why they dehumanize the opposition. That is what we are saying that the danger of the media is that it could make people accept what is totally unacceptable. A European uh, journalist published that one out of every five Muslims in, the, uh, uh, in that European country, which I'm not going to say in which country, is an ISIS sympathizer. That is to say, 20% of the Muslims in this country are ISIS sympathizers. That's what the media can do, damage people like that, damage the relationship between Muslims and their neighbors. What happened next day after they published that in a, in a very famous European uh, newspaper, next day a man pushed off a Muslim girl waiting on train platform in front of the train trying to kill her. What made him do that? By the way, this man, I don't believe that he is a culprit only. He had never committed any act of violence before, but the pressure he was continuously exposed to made him hate his neighbors and regard them as non-human. Therefore, he does not deserve, they do not deserve to live. He saw his neighbor as a source of danger, which should be uh, eliminated. So he dehumanized that girl and he pushed her in front of the train. So speech is faced by speech. Unfortunately, some people think that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ordered the killing of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, who was a, um, a uh, Jewish poet who used to attack Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims and the Muslim women. They think that he ordered uh, uh, execution for him because of defaming of the Prophet and the Muslim women, despite the, uh, the, that it is mentioned clearly in uh, the book of Tafsir, al jamia li ahkam al-Qur'an for the Qurtubi, uh, when explaining uh, Surah An-Nisa, that Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf had a terrorist cell inside Medina of 70 people, and they allied with Quraysh to fight against Prophet Muhammad. So he was a traitor and a terrorist, and he, ha he was the head of a sleeping cell inside Medina, an armed cell ready to fight inside Medina. That cell had to be dismantled, not because he was a poet who defamed Prophet Muhammad and the Muslim women, no. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to face words with words. When will Muslims think about that? When will Muslims think about what is best for Islam and work in the fields that Islam needs and guide their children in those areas, especially media? Or will everyone think only about himself and his interests and keep pushing our children to become doctors and engineers? While the, the, the Islamophobes are taking control of the media. God willing that day will come when we will start thinking about the benefit of, of Islam more than our own benefits and interests, that generation will arise to work for the triumph of Islam, inshallah, and for the interests of the nation. May Allah reward you and see you, inshallah, tomorrow in another memory and another lesson. As-salamu alaykum.